this is his paper. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the hardest working man in research, James Brown of, of Sigma. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, I'm Mr. Rourke. Um, I'll be your host for the next uh, for the next few minutes until somebody gives me the hook. Um, we have uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Wolf who's going to present his paper on um, uh, achievement and attainment effects. Oh, I'm sorry, I th thought I had a booming baritone that everybody could hear. Um, we have Dr. Patrick Wolf who's going to present his um, his paper on achievement and attainment effects uh, and uh, how. They present themselves across a variety of school choice programs. One might say this is a meta-analysis. I think I'm getting this right. Um, you can put the English major in charge of the statistics panel, and, uh, and the reading level comes way down. Um, and then we're going to have uh, Michael Q. McShane, uh, a man in the middle, Natalie Array, uh, to as a respondent, and also uh, Professor Marty West, who is uh, who took the short jaunt over here from his office in the uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education um, as responding. I have some questions which we uh, may or may not use. Um, I think some, some of them are worth using, uh, but I'd like to turn it over to you. I'll moderate that session. I just want to be really clear about something. A question is a really short sentence that goes up at the end. <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna remind people of that uh, aggressively as we proceed through uh, through the tail end of the, uh, the presentation. So without further ado, Dr. Wolf. All right. So, did Bill Oberndorf hack into my presentation? <laughs> Sure looks that way. <laughs> All of a sudden, we are talking about educational choice, and not school choice. So, why do we think test scores are so important? Um, I think there are uh, good reasons why we researchers have obsessed with measuring the test score effects of education interventions. There are psychometric properties. Uh, they they measure the content of the test at known levels of reliability, and that's plus. Uh, just the basic intuition. I mean, we, we, it seems like test scores should matter. They should make a difference in, in students' lives. Um, we see smart people with high test scores, and we figure really good things are going to happen to them. School accountability systems, of course, are built around test scores. Uh, no Child Left Behind is, is the clearest example of that, but Basically, uh, you know, when, when, when schools are held accountable, they're held accountable for test scores. Uh, sometimes test score levels, uh, sometimes test score gains, but it's, it's all in the scores. And there is a famous study by Chetty Friedman and Rockoff that found if you take teacher value added, it affects, uh, in, in test scores, it predicts future educational attainment of students, which then predicts higher lifetime earnings. So they chart this connection between test score effects, attainment effects, and better things happening for kids in their lives. So why might we question this reliance on test score effects in evaluating choice programs? Uh, first of all, we know that test scores are heavily influenced by background. Factors. James Coleman famously established this in the Coleman report, and it's, it's, it's accepted right now. And so, you know, the question is, what can educational interventions do beyond what the student is bringing into the classroom in terms of boosting test scores? They're only an intermediate outcome. I mean, test scores really don't mean anything in and of themselves. Uh, hopefully, they are a, a uh, harbinger of more meaningful sorts of things uh, and outcomes like educational attainment and, and uh, lifetime earnings and stuff. They are gameable. Uh, there's a deep literature, David Figlio has, has contributed to this and others, um, that you know, if you serve student, students certain meals, they do better on test scores. Um, you know, there are extreme examples of cheating in Atlanta, people went to jail. Uh, to boost test scores, so you know there is that problem. 
Um, and the very reason that they are the basis of educational accountability systems means there are strong incentives to uh, game or, or cheat. And this is called Campbell's Law, basically. If you, if, you, if you attach consequences to a measurement, it will no longer be as reliable as it used to be. Uh, and finally, we're talking about schools of choice. And schools of choice distinguish themselves. They differentiate. Some of them focus on, on teaching the whole child, character traits, uh, getting kids through. Some focus on test score games. It's called academic press. Very few schools have the resources and ability to focus on both. So we really might, I think we have good reason to expect the possibility of a disconnect. So why focus on, on findings from ed choice programs? Do you see that? See that, Bill? Yeah. Okay. We're not kidding around here. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, students with higher test scores achieve more educational attainment. And educational attainment is high school graduation, college enrollment, college completion. We know there's that connection, but a lot of what produces that connection could be inherent in the individual student. Ed choice interventions consistently are evaluated based on their test score effects. So we know we have a base of test score findings out there because all of us who have been evaluating choice programs you know, since the 1990s have at least focused on test scores. Uh, however, attainment matters more than achievement in the long run. This point Bill made in his, in his opening comments. There's a much deeper research literature connecting lifetime outcomes to attainment levels than there is connecting lifetime outcomes to achievement levels. So if short-term achievement effects don't reliably predict attainment effects, we are making faulty judgments about the effectiveness of choice programs in the short run. What is educational choice in our study? We defined it broadly uh, because we wanted to include as many studies as possible to, to bring as much evidence to bear on this question. So we include private education choice programs, public charter schools, and various forms of school choice managed by school districts, magnet schools, open enrollment, small schools of choice, early college high schools, vocational schools of choice. <coughs> And what do we define as achievement and attainment? Achievement, uh, English language arts or ELA scores, and math scores. Too few studies included uh, additional scores like science and social studies, so we focus on those two. You need to say achievement and attainment up there, right? Oh, yes, yes, sorry. I, I finished this at 3 a.m. because I, I lost the original version that on my, when he was my flight to Detroit. Ed choice too. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and so achievement and attainment, fine. And, and it, as I mentioned, attainment, high school graduation, college enrollment, college completion effects. So we can have, in a single cohort in a study, we can have six permutations and combinations here. Uh, ELA results match to all three of the attainment results, math results match to all three of the attainment results. If you have multi-cohort studies, you know, the, the numbers can multiply. But we found 24 studies to include in our analysis. Uh, we did this through a combination of systematic and network search. Google Scholar was the focus of the systematic search. Uh, and we used search terms that had those six combinations I, I spoke of. Each of the achievement possibilities connected to each of the attainment possibilities. We then reviewed abstracts to see if, if there were good prospects to include, and then the entire paper to determine eligibility. We then augmented that with a network search where we identified more studies, and this was from harvesting the citations of every eligible study and searching the personal websites and organizational websites of every study. So, so Brian Gill, his personal website got searched. Um, I found a social security number, all kinds of great stuff. And Mathematical Policy Research's uh, uh, website got searched for, for additional studies. And to be eligible to make the cut, it had to be a study of one of these forms of ed choice. Uh, the overall project had to include both achievement and attainment, so there, and there had to be a connection between the study of achievement and attainment. Either it had to be in the same report 
or it had to be produced by um, a group of authors with some overlap or, or institutional connection so that we knew it was the same study, using the same database, for example. And we also had a pretty broad definition of what was acceptable research design, experimental, quasi-experimental, or observational with controls. Only one of the studies was, was the weakest uh, category, observational with controls. Most of them were experimental or quasi-experimental. Did one of us write that week's paper? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Present company excluded. So we coded them, as, as Durrell mentioned, it's, it's a sort of meta-analysis. It's the simplest form of meta-analysis. It's called vote counting. And so for each of those outcomes, achievement or attainment, we classified it. Was the result positive or negative? Was it statistically significant or not statistically significant? Now, Bill pointed out that people outside of academia don't care about uh, statistically significant or non-statistically significant. They sometimes make judgments based on it, whether it's, it's significant or not. And so we wanted our coding to reflect the kinds of decisions and, and arguments and discussions that are made in conventional policy circles. And so, and so if, if, if regular people um, think that a negative sign on an insignificant coalition means something, then we're, 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 going to, we're going to factor that into our analysis. Now later on I'll show you what happens when we're more scientific. So, so basically this creates a four by four matrix. Uh, you've got the achievement effects on the, the vertical axis because we get them first and we want to know if they predict the attainment outcomes that are on the horizontal axis. And basically, perfectly predicting means that a case lies on the primary diagonal, from the upper left to the lower right. That's also called the trace of the matrix. And that's the, the, the language I'm going to use here. And basically, you see that only uh, 49 of the 126 paired achievement attainment findings from this, this set of studies fall on that primary, primary diagonal. The area above the primary diagonal is called the upper triangle. That's where the um, errors are because attainment was better than achievement. You see most of the other cases are up in there showing that we, we tend to get better results on the attainment metric from choice studies than the achievement metric. The lower triangle has the errors uh, in the other direction, where we got better results from achievement than attainment. And there are enough there to suggest that this just isn't, this isn't simply a case of attainment uh, is, is, is more easily produced through choice than, than achievement. Sometimes it's the reverse. But these, there's a lot of dependency in these. They were drawn from 24 studies. Um, you know, especially there's dependency between an ELA result from a particular study and a math result from a particular study, and certainly the attainment results. So we deal with that by separating them out and just looking at the evidence from that primary diagonal, from that trace, where they match up and, and how they don't match up. So these are some descriptive statistics on the different matrices, yeah, Bill doesn't like the matrices part. Wait till I get to asymptotic standard errors, Bill. You're, you're, gonna, you're gonna love that. It's my favorite kind of standard error, see asymptotic. So the N is the number of studies that fit each, each combination. The trace is the percentage of the pairings that fall on that primary diagonal. We generally would like to see that over 50%. Uh, Pearson's chi-squared basically determines, and, and the significance test on that determines, um, is the arrangement of cases throughout the matrix systematic at all? Is, is it purely random? Does it look like it's purely random? Or does it look like there's a pattern? The gamma describes if the pattern is test scores positively and accurately predicting attainment. So, so both going in the right direction and closely connected um, if it's if perfect connection is one, uh, perfect negative prediction is minus one, and no association at all is zero. <laughs> so basically, what we want to see is a systematic pattern, so a p-value less than 0.05, 
and we want to see a gamma that's positive and non-trivial. And we see that in one out of the six overall cases here, that ELA results from choice studies predict college graduation reasonably well. 64% of the findings are on the trace. Uh, that's, that's a statistically significant pattern, and the gamma indicates it's positive and, and actually, actually quite, quite close. So, so that's a win. The test scores predict college graduation in the 11 studies, or I'm sorry, the 11 findings where we have both of those outcomes in choice studies. In all the other ones, we see no pattern, even though in many of those cases there's a much higher number of cases, there's more evidence, and so we would, see, we would expect to be more likely to see a systematic pattern in those higher end categories. We don't. So, so one out of six, pretty disappointing. Now, let's look at separate types of educational choice. There are only three studies at, when, when, we, when we did the analysis, there are only three studies of private school choice that linked achievement with attainment. So that's too few to have as a separate category. So we just separate out charter school studies from all other choice studies. Um, and when we, when we look at it, uh, the, the same comparison, this is all ELA, the top three, our charter school test scores, ELA test scores predicting the different levels of attainment. The bottom three are public school choice, non-charter choice predicting. And we see that only in the one case that uh, public school choice, public controlled by the district, produce, it, it links ELA scores significantly with college graduation in 10 cases. Uh, and so that's a win for this, for this connection between test score results and attainment results. One out of six, again. Uh, for math, it's even worse. Not only are there no significant connections between the test score effects on math achievement and uh, the, the attainment measures for either charter school separately or other forms of public school choice separately, but the direction of the relationship is, all, is actually negative. What that means is if you looked at the test score effects of the math, test score effects of a choice program, and you wanted to predict what the attainment results would be, you'd be better off flipping a coin than using the math results as your predictor. So this is pretty, pretty stunning. So the question is, does anything predict attainment? Is this just a function of, of the challenges of our methodology of taking one impact estimate with uh, error around it and, and another one with error around it and trying to get them to connect? The good news is high school graduation strongly predicts college enrollment and other attainment levels uh, effects also come very close to significantly predicting uh, college enrollment. So attainment predicts attainment. The problem's not with our methodology. The problem's also not with our definition of school choice. Here, if you exclude each of the categories of school choice serially, this is a sensitivity test pioneered by Levine and Reynolds in, in the econ literature, you find that there are no cases where a single category of school choice is driving the results down. In fact, the the, the greatest candidate for that would be vocational high schools. We think that they would, would only focus uh, on, 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 it, on uh, achievement and, and not attainment, but actually what you get is you get, you get um, a worse relationship between the two outcomes when you exclude vocational high schools. And finally, uh, if we treat all non-significance as null, we get the same result, one positive association, ELA with college graduation, the others are non-significant. So, in ed evaluations, ELA results weakly and inconsistently predict long-term attainment effects, while math effects negatively predict them. They, are, they point in the opposite direction, on average, of where attainment's gonna go. It's not due to our methodology, definition of choice, or treatment of non-significant findings. And we think the implications are, are really important for when and how we judge whether a school choice program or a school of choice is succeeding and what actions we take 
in support of or against that school of choice as a result of short-term test scores, which don't seem to be telling us much about how far these kids are gonna go later in life. Thanks. Uh, uh, both Marty and Mike, you now have uh, nine minutes because you can't cut into your time, but uh, I know you'd like to talk to one another instead of... I can handle that. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, it was a pleasure to read this paper. As I told Mike, it's been keeping me up at night over the past several days. Uh, and so I'm uh, <laughs> looking forward to having the opportunity to discuss it. Um, there's a lot that I like about it. It's hard to imagine a paper that is addressing a topic of more fundamental importance, really for the world of education policy, our approaches to trying to regulate and improve performance and for how we go about conducting evaluations in the education reform space. I also like the idea of focusing as we address this broad topic of the connection between effects on achievement and attainment of focusing on educational choice in particular. Uh, and that's because there is a good body of evidence suggesting that school choice programs are more positive in terms of their effects on attainment than on achievement overall. There's some theoretical reasons why that might be the case, especially in an era where there are strong pressures among public schools to uh, focus on performance as measured by test scores. And so I think this is a really rich context in which to explore this question. Their methods in terms of identifying studies uh, are quite thorough. Uh, I'm quite confident that they've identified the set of studies available to us that meet the criteria that they lay out. And the paper is remarkably transparent about how it codes individual studies. It has a nice capsule description of literally every study that is included and other aspects of the methods that they employ, which is not always the case when you're uh, dealing with this type of review of the literature. Um, I also agree with the fundamental uh, conclusion that improving test scores appears to be neither a necessary nor a sufficient condition for improving the later life outcomes that truly matter. In fact, I don't think we needed a review of the literature in order to draw that conclusion, however. Uh, we just needed an example of at least one study in which that pattern of findings emerge. Uh, that being said, I think it's an important point to keep in mind of fundamental importance for uh, how we think about the school choice literature. All that said, uh, my job here is not to praise Caesar, uh, but to bury him. <laughs> uh, and that's like especially the case. Well, this is like three researchers at <laughs> or one researcher. Well, leaves. that's especially the case given that the second discussant is a co author on the paper. I feel like I need to be particularly aggressive. So let me share some of the concerns I have about the paper in its current form. Uh, the first is just the assumption that any attainment measure is better than a test scores as a measure of educational progress. Uh, Pat made the straightforward claim in his presentation that attainment is more important than achievement. And so let's dig into that a little bit. We know that both test scores and attainment and impacts on them as a result of educational interventions are correlated with earnings, health, happiness, human flourishing. And so it's not immediately clear a priori which one we want to prioritize. And there are at least some reasons to think that we should continue to focus on cognitive skills as measured by test scores, even as we acknowledge the importance of attainment as well. For example, thinking about aggregate well-being, Rick Hanishik and Luger Wussman show that test scores are strong predictors of economic growth rates across countries, while once you take into account the level of skills in a national population, years of schooling completed doesn't seem to have much of an uh, effect at all. And so, you know, at the aggregate level, we probably just don't want to be producing more and more graduates. We want to produce people with better skills. And so at the extreme, we need to be keeping both in mind. Also, a recent study by a couple of economists uh, showed quite convincingly that the labor market at this point it doesn't seem to be the case that a high school diploma has much, if any, signaling value in the labor market. That is, conditional on skills, which they're able to hold content, the constant by comparing students who just barely passed or failed their last chance to complete an exit exam required for a diploma in Texas and Florida, they find no benefit 
of actually receiving the diploma. And so, you know, this suggests that high school graduation in and of itself, conditional on skills, may not be what students need. As well, Pat mentioned the, prob the possibility of test scores being blamed. Well, I think if you've been following recent headlines, you know that high school graduation rates can be manipulated as well. Um, in addition, it may be the case that rigorous graduation standards in a school or a program may benefit students even if it doesn't lead them to be more likely to graduate, even if it has an adverse effect on their probability of graduating, if it leaves some students to be better off as they move into college. Um, turning to measures of attainment at the college level, uh, most of the research focuses on college enrollment. You don't have to follow students for quite as long to look at whether they enroll in college. Um, but it's not clear that enrolling in college, if you're no more likely to complete it, is a good thing. You might end up with uh, a lot of lost time, a bunch of debt, and no degree at the end of the day. I'll concede that college graduation seems unambiguously good, but this is available yeah. for only a very small number of studies. And interestingly enough, it's the one outcome for which they find evidence of a, of a positive relationship with test score effects. Second question, because of the transparency of the researchers, quite admirable, you can look into the decisions they made about coding up specific studies. And so uh, I just want to illustrate that there's some judgment that goes into these coding decisions. So for example, one study I know well is research that was done here in Boston on the effects of attending a oversubscribed charter school. Um, and this research shows uh, not just positive and significant, but dramatically positive impacts on test scores in both English language arts and math. Um, but interestingly enough, it shows negative effects on high school graduation in their first analysis of graduation after four years that Patrick focuses on as the primary result from this study, and it shows no clear effect on college enrollment. If you dig into the results, though, one of the things you see is that that negative effect on high school graduation goes away if you let students have five years rather than four years to complete, and it actually turns insignificantly positive. And uh, so this suggests to me that that apparent negative effect is a result of higher standards in the school students are attending that I would argue are beneficial. And I don't see that as a evidence of a disconnect, that, which is how it's influencing their study, um, but rather as something that is consistent. Also, if you look at the details on college enrollment, you actually see a huge shift in the share of, four, of students in those schools attending four-year rather than two-year schools. Now, consistent with what I just said, that may not be a good thing if those students are less likely to complete a degree. That being said, all the evidence that we have suggests that you're actually more likely to complete college if you go to a four-year rather than a two-year degree. We can wait and see how that unfolds, but I'm not willing at this point to use this as evidence of a disconnect between achievement and attainment. In fact, I would argue that it's more evidence of the opposite. Um, Patrick's own study of the DC voucher program found positive and insignificant effects on test scores, positive and significant effects on high school graduation rates. One of the interesting things, though, is that the samples for these two analyses differ, right? The graduation analysis is based on the students who enrolled in high school. The test score affects students who enrolled at younger grades. It's not clear to me whether I expect the program's effects to line up for different students. It's not clear to me that it should be included in a study of the linkage between effects on the two outcomes at all. And then, turning forward the dial a little bit, Matt Chingos has now followed up on this and finds no effect on college enrollment uh, for either sample, be looking at the full set of participants. And so it's not clear to me how this would influence or the judgments on these issue in, uh, uh, issues would influence their overall pattern of results, but I just want to illustrate that it's not uh, straightforward interpreting one study with this question in mind. Should all choice programs be included uh, is another question I had. One of the author's conclusions is that school choice programs and specific types of schools of choice appear to specialize in producing either achievement gains or attainment benefits. I don't think you needed that to be a conclusion of the study. In some cases, this is clearly by design. I would argue that early college high schools seem more like the type of nudge intervention aimed at promoting college access condition on academic preparation. So, there are all these interventions aimed at promoting college access, like texting students over the summer to make sure they get their forms in on time. That's an attempt to promote college enrollment, holding skill constant. 
And we wouldn't say it's evidence of a disconnect if we saw effects on one outcome and not the other. I think some choice programs you might think of in those same terms. Similarly, career and technical education aims by design to promote graduation and post-secondary options, specific types of them, while uh, really by placing less emphasis on general academic skills. So it's not clear to me that programs that have that design should be included in an analysis of the relationship between achievement and attainment effects in choice programs generally. Uh, finally, and this is the last substantive point I'll make, uh, the issue of statistical power. So statistical power, which essentially means the probability that if a effect exists, we will find it with the study that we conduct, is a challenge in the literature of school choice because of the relatively small scale of the programs that have been studied, uh, that have been enacted. Uh, it's particularly a challenge for studies of the effects of school choice on attainment because those studies require following students for an extended period of time uh, and not many opportunities have emerged to do that. The approach the authors take, which is essentially uh, a vote counting approach where they're counting the number of results that fall into one of those four categories that Patrick talked about, really amplifies this problem of statistical power by focusing on whether a given result is statistically significant or not. So engage in a little thought exercise to think about how this might matter. Let's assume that there's a choice program that produces an effect of 0.2 standard deviations on test scores, and that it has a standard error of 0.05 standard deviations. And I base that assumption on Patrick's study of the DC voucher program, so a reasonably large study in the literature. And then let's take the results that Patrick mentioned that tell us how much we would expect in terms of an improvement in attainment given a test score increase of that time and say how big an effect on attainment should we see? Well, based on the results of Raj Chetty and colleague, we would, colleagues, we would actually expect to see a 1.4 percentage point increase in college enrollment. We have to figure out what standard error we might have in a typical study of this topic. So I looked at Matt Chingos and Paul Peterson's study of the New York City voucher uh, study, its effects on college enrollment. They had a sample of 2,500 students. If you make those assumptions, conduct those studies, you'll find a statistically significant effect for test scores 98% of the time, but only 10% of the time for the study of college enrollment. So the authors look at the disconnect, that is the fact that studies aren't arrayed perfectly along the diagonal in those matrices that they showed, and they say if we simply use an achievement result to predict an attainment result, we'd be more wrong, uh, we'd be wrong more often than not. I, I actually think it's exactly the opposite, that in many cases you would predict a statistically insignificant finding rather than a statistically significant one based on the results you see with respect to attainment. I think the big limitation of the paper at this point is this vote counting approach. Uh, a more common approach in meta-analyses these days would not just focus on whether a result is statistically significant or not, despite the fact that that may be how the policy community interprets these results, but rather would focus on the size of the uh, effects on either outcome, the amount of information we get out of them from the study, and look at the relationship between those. And I suspect that we might see a different pattern emerge if the authors were to go in that direction. I don't have time to talk about what this will mean for policy, but uh, Mike can pick up there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, Marty, Marty's stepping on you. So just throwing it out there. All right, that's okay. So, oh boy, short person problems. Here we go. All right. So, um, in his landmark tome, Bureaucracy, a uh, longtime Harvard professor, James Q. Wilson, uh, opens by arguing that only two groups of people deny that organization matters, uh, economists and everyone else. <laughs> that joke wouldn't work in a lot of rooms. I'm glad that, that it worked here. But firms and bureaucracies, of which schools of choice sit at an interesting intersection of the two, are complex, living things that have both internal and external pressures, frequent difficulties in articulating and communicating goals, tasks, and mission, and periodically curtailed autonomy. 
So when I read Pat's paper, uh, to which Marty alluded to, I was brought on in the very late stages, uh, mostly for another version of the, the, the paper for a more policy-oriented audience. So all faults are his and all the good stuff is mine. Um, He's high uh, me. Yeah, totally. I'm throwing you under the bus right now. No. I think uh, not of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, written by a fellow son of the great state of Missouri, T.S. Eliot, but rather the love song of James Q. Wilson. Uh, Wilson's central argument is that in any effective bureaucracy, schools included, they have to have a critical task, a problem to solve, a mission, a shared vision of what they need to do to solve that problem, and the autonomy to achieve that mission. And I think unpacking each of those, critical task, mission, and autonomy, can help us understand and contextualize Pat's findings. So the first, many schools of choice do not put maximizing test scores at the top of their priority list. They define their critical task differently. Um, for some of you may be familiar with a network of Catholic schools called the Notre Dame ACE Academies. I am a proud graduate of the ACE program, as are I believe, several other people in the, this room today. So we're having a little reunion today, which is great. Um, but after uh, embarking on a teaching, uh, teacher and leader training program, they actually started operating a network of schools uh, in Arizona, in Florida, and in, in Indiana, particularly in states that have private school choice programs. And if you ever get the chance to visit one of these schools, which I highly recommend, um, if they're not in their uniforms, uh, when their you know, bright-faced children are running around the playground, if you see the t-shirts that they give kids and parents or signs on the wall that have their mission, what they're trying to do, the back of the t-shirt has two words, college and heaven. Um, now, I know we're studying uh, long-term results, and that second one is that's a real long-term result that's <laughs> going out to infinity. Um, but I do think... Bill said that he can help us get data. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm just saying. That would, uh, that would be great. Um, he has connections. <laughs> he does. So, but I think of thinking about that, a school that's so directly placing its mission on these admittedly incredibly long-term outcomes, one slightly more proximate than the other, um, might make us think that, look, we might not pick up some of the stuff that that school is doing in the short term, uh, but we could see changes over the long term because of this focus. I think some of the survey data that we have, both about schools and parents, help buttress this point. So Brian Casita, Pat Wolf, uh, and Evan Reinsmith in 2015 did a study of private school leaders in Florida, in Indiana, in Louisiana. They posed the question, what three characteristics does your school have that distinguishes it from nearby public schools? Number one, religious education. Number two, better learning environment. Number three, more attention to unique student needs. Higher standardized test scores came in 16th. In a 2013 Ed Choice, where, I'm, uh, where I work now, survey of parents participating in the Georgia private school scholarship program, um, when asked what the reason for choosing your private school was, top six, better learning environment, better education, smaller class sizes, more individualized attention, religious education, prep for college. Higher test scores came in 15th around a third of the respondents. When they were asked what the most important factor is, a grand total of zero parents said higher test scores. And when asked what the second most important uh, factor was, only 0.9% identified test scores. So I think neither the schools nor the parents that choose to place uh, children there uh, place a high priority on maximizing test scores. That is not their critical task. So the second, many schools of choice purposely eschew state standards and associated tests. They have a different mission. And this is where I might disagree with my uh, esteemed colleague uh, Marty in, in talking about the, the uh, set of schools that should be included in these programs. Um, I think that having as broad of a definition of school choice is good because this is having diverse schools with lots of different missions and lots of different things that they're trying to do is a feature and not a bug of school choice and something that has to be taken into account uh, when we study it. I think uh, to a great degree, um, I experienced this uh, firsthand. I host this thing called the Cool Schools Podcast. Shameless plug right here if you want to check it out. Where I had this opportunity to interview innovative school leaders, private school leaders, charter school leaders, and others and talk about the schools that they run, the lessons that they've learned. And I cannot tell you how many times, this thing that strikes me is how many schools say that they exist in reaction to or in opposition to the dominant ideology and pedagogy of traditional public schools. That's why they do what they do. Um, I think, a bit of editorializing here, this issue was particularly exacerbated by the Common Core. I don't want to relitigate that fight, but simply say that for lots of private schools, saying that we don't do the Common Core is a unifying cry. 
Um, and so I think measuring schools with the tools that measure public schools, Common Core or not, could lead to the idea of false positives and false negatives that Pat finds. But because folks still want to graduate, still want to go to college, might not necessarily see it there. They just have different interpretations of what kids need to do to get there. So schools are trying to do something different than the public schools around them. They have a different mission. Therefore, tools commonly used to measure what public schools are doing are mismatched for what schools of choice are doing. I don't think that's something that we should necessarily be either surprised or scandalized by. Um, but now, the rubber meets the road when it comes to Wilson's uh, third element, and that is autonomy. Should schools be able to define their critical task differently? How does emphasizing one measure affect the autonomy that they need to succeed? You know, when this paper came out or when people are talking about it, a common refrain that I hear whenever we talk about having uh, judging schools based on test scores, whether that's in charter school authorized or private school choice programs or others, I keep hearing this, oh, well, you know, like good schools don't have to worry about this. We're only using this to identify the worst. So if you got a good school, it doesn't really matter. Um, and I worry about a chilling effect. I know my friend uh, Robert Pondiskio, who's here, Jay Green, who's not, have written in the past of around accountability programs, that, that there is this risk that, that good schools might manipulate their behavior so that they never find out what happens if they're classed in these lower performing schools, uh, which I think is a problem. And especially if we don't have a great deal of confidence in the, the test score measures in evaluating schools and schools of choice, that chilling effect could have serious negative consequences. I think there are secondary problems. You know, Darrell Bradford, our uh, esteemed moderator here, has a great piece in Education Next this week talking about the biases against mom and pop charter schools, um, uh, the kind of individual operators that aren't part of big CMOs or EMOs. I think there's also true that there's a kind of bias against schools that are trying to do something different. If this exacerbates that problem, that's a big deal. And finally, I think ultimately this comes down to a question of the burden of proof. Um, <laughs> Some people have taken the, the more policy-oriented uh, version of this paper that came out, and, and they want to use it as a cudgel to say, oh, you know, tests are garbage, they don't tell us anything, or other folks sort of respond because they want to say tests are awesome, and so our, our paper is, is wrong. But I tend to think of it not as a kind of dichotomous variable like that, but as a continuous one, right? Some give us more information, some give us less. But as we move up, the more consequential decisions that we want to use this tool and that's all test, re test results are, it's a tool, to restrict the autonomy of school leaders and particularly of parents to choose an environment that might meet the needs of their kids, the more confidence we need to have that that metric says what we say it says. Um, because particularly, uh, because test scores are being used to overrule parents who have a strong motivation to put their kids in schools that are, that are good for them, we have to do better than just saying that we think that these, uh, that these results are perhaps directionally right or, or there's a lot of fuzzy edges around them. Organizations have to have the autonomy to achieve their critical task. Parents are highly motivated to put their children in schools that are good for them, and I think that we overrule them at our peril. Thank you. Okay, so uh, like uh, Sam Jackson in Pulp Fiction, I'm gonna allow Patrick to retort. Uh, and then uh, I got a couple questions, we'll open it up for everybody, so go right ahead. So, so just very quickly, uh, thank you, Marty, for the, for the comments. Um, on the uh, uh, trimming the, the definition of ed choice, excluding those two categories that you mentioned, uh, we can do it, it doesn't make a difference. Um, secondly, on the, on the uh, uh, lower power for the attainment effects, uh, actually what we're seeing is the reverse of what you predict, and that is that the attainment results are overperforming their low power, their lower power, and the achievement effects are underperforming their higher power. So we're getting more statistical significance from the lower powered attainment samples than we're getting from the, from the higher powered achievement samples. So, I mean, in a particular case, you can kind of engineer that, that result, but in the aggregate, what we're seeing is the opposite. And, and the third point I just want to make is, is, and I think we try to make it clear in the paper, is we just wanted to start a dialogue on this. We don't pretend that this is the last word or the definitive word on this disconnect. We just want people talking about it. Right? think we succeed. <laughs> so I um, uh, so just let, let, let's hop right in. Um, I, I happen to, I will show my hand. I'm a supporter of test scores, uh, but I'm sort of 
my views are evolving. Um, what does this mean for a policymaker? Like uh, uh, you're, a, you're a state ed chief, you are designing a school choice program, like what, what, what are the big takeaways and what should I apply to program design in your estimation? Okay, yeah. you're the short straw on that one. Um, look, I, I think what this tells us, and, and I think it's an important thing to take away from this paper, is not in any way saying that the test scores are useless or that they don't tell us anything. I think that what it tells us, what I take away from this paper is that there is this kind of fuzziness around the measure, fuzziness around the edges of it. And if that's the case, we need to think about how we use that in making consequential decisions about what parents can do, what schools can do, and others. So, so I tend to think that test scores can be used to supplement human judgment, right? Not to replace human judgment, but to supplement. I think in, in too many places, both in the sort of accountability movement and increasingly in, in school choice areas, we're trying to use these metrics to replace human judgment. I think take them into account along with other things that we're able, other data that we're able to collect on schools. One of the things that I think is, uh, that I've been interested in looking into but I haven't had the chance yet, of looking at you know, how many of these schools that have low test scores have growing enrollment. I know at least in where I live in Kansas City that has this big rich charter market, if you look at the low performing schools, it's not like there's this one metric that they're sticking out on and, and everything else looks great. They're, hemorrhaging students and others. So taking all of those things into account, if you're a charter school authorizer or others, can help make the decision, hey, this school needs to close, or this school, we want to allow it to open, et cetera. So I think using test scores to supplement human judgment, which allows us to take into account the fuzziness that, that we have around these things and make better decisions. So uh, I'll just yeah. chime in briefly. I agree with everything that Mike just said, as well as everything that he said along similar lines in his initial remarks. I just didn't update my views on that as a result of reading this <laughs> review of the, of the literature. Of course we need to use test scores along with other indicators as well. I worry that the message being sent by this review, regardless of whether the author's intended or not, is that we should not use test scores at all. I mean, my preferred approach would be to promote a high degree of transparency among, about test scores uh, to parents uh, but then find ways to actually incorporate metrics of parental demand as informed by what we know about test scores into the decisions we make about which schools are able to expand. That becomes easier to do in a more systematic way if you create a unified enrollment system such that parents actually have a um, sort of incentive to be sincere about their preferences over which school that they attend, then you can actually get a very good measure of parental demand from that. So. Um, I, I also think that we certainly need to be very cautious about using test scores to evaluate programs that, in the ways I was suggesting, uh, are not designed, first of all, to raise test scores. So, I mean, I agree with all that. I just am not sure that the literature, given the number of studies, the amount of information you've been able to extract from them, and the decisions that have to be made in coding them at this point, given that we don't observe what we ultimately want to observe in the long run, allow us to really inform you know, uh, that issue. Did any of the studies include me measures of parental satisfaction or demand at all? Uh, we, we didn't look at that. Uh, we certainly, it, it would be a, sub, a subset of them, particularly uh, tilted toward the voucher studies uh, that, that Paul and I uh, have done, and, other, and Matt and other people have done. A lot of the charter school research, they don't administer surveys, so it's it's just it's just administrative data uh, from on test scores and, and attainment. So it would be a small subsample of the cases, but it would certainly be worth looking at and seeing if if parental satisfaction is as good a predictor. I mean, it's probably going to be at least a better predictor than math. I mean, because it's not going to be negative. Can you talk about that? Like, I, I, I uh, it's a mind blow. Yeah. It's I, what the heck is going on with math? Um, I mean, why would it why would it be negatively predictive of future attainment? In this Especially study? when so many of the sort of high performing charter networks have closed math gaps much more quickly than other gaps. Like that's the that's the uh, the the first indicator that things are going in the right direction. Just, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just think, I'm just gonna throw out one hypothesis, and that is there's, there's a shortage of, of talented math teachers, and um, I, I don't think, I think they, they end up being distributed in a way 
where you know they're 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 producing benefits in some schools that aren't focused on attainment and and you know on fo schools focused on attainment they're not landing the, the great math teachers and there's it's some kind of allocational issue um, but it's 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 serious and I I think we just need to unpack it uh, more to to the extent we can. So I have uh, an, another question was brought up, but the floor is officially open. So if you have something to say, raise your hand. Oh, okay, this is good. Okay, if you want something to say, all right. Uh, um, just one question before we go to this. Um, what about multiple definitions of type of choice? So there's some, uh, so Connecticut uses magnets primarily as a spur for integration. Newark, most of the magnets are about high performance. Like they, you know, you, you, you test it and you look at what goes out. Like, did, did, the, did your findings present any difference across, uh, like there are multiple kinds of vocational technical schools, some which are like nudge you uh, in the, the avuncular way and, and some that are um, uh, sort of high tech high things. Did, did that present any difference in what you found at all? Or? Well, you know, with, with a small st set of studies, we have to be careful in how granular we can be because then we're just, you know, drawing conclusions from kind of single cases and stuff like that. Why would, why would so, you not do that? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would just say, I mean, I agree completely with Marty's point about how, you know, we should, we should use sort of, sort of balanced scorecards and we should customize our evaluations of choice programs and, and choice schools to reflect what their their missions are and what they're supposed to achieve, but we just don't see that in the policy community at all. And so, if, if all we do is start a discussion about that kind of customization, I think you know we will have we will have struck a, a blow for for goodness and justice. Mm -hmm. So since this is his house, uh, we're going to go Paul, Halley, Paul, Bill. So go, sir. Okay. So um, Anna and I did a study in Florida where we looked at the oversubscribed charter schools and the ones that were not oversubscribed as reported by the schools themselves. Uh, and we found that the effects on high school graduation were much stronger for the oversubscribed, where that is for parental demand for that school was greater. So that raises a question, could we use some indicator of parental demand for that school as an indicator of effectiveness. And, and could you, Mr. Wolf or Mr. West, actually do an analysis to see whether you could get better predictions using that as your indicator than test school? I think you just got your next paper. <laughs> uh, Hallie? Uh, so uh, I, you know, I've worked in policy for a long time, so I like assessment scores because they're easy, right, and objective. Uh, but I started my career in education as a teacher, and what I hear from teachers so much is just that they hate the focus on assessments, and uh, you know, they would much prefer a portfolio approach, for example, which is very subjective. And so I'm just kind of like wondering about the huge gap between like what researchers want and what teachers want in terms of assessing student performance. Well, I was going to say, and I think some of it came up to the, the sort of survey data that I gave, uh, as well as parents. You know, when parents are choosing, they, they if you look at that, that data, they're saying, you know, we want a good academic environment, and, and we want to, but test scores are not necessarily, don't carry a lot of weight with with parents either, I mean, they, they consistently rank it as a, as a lower tool there too. So I think I think the disconnect is even has even more facets than that. But like, what's like, where's the middle? Like, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, I mean, so uh, my hope has been that the uh, uh, the unintended responses on the part of educators and what they've experienced and as the effects of testing are rather the effects of very poorly designed accountability systems that make very unrealistic expectations about the rate of improvement that their school should demonstrate and you know, have led to uh, them experiencing a lot of pressure. Uh, my hope is that we're in the process of shifting to um, an era where we'll 
put more emphasis on transparency about achievement scores, less on you know, explicit <coughs> rewards and sanctions based on unrealistic expectations, and that that will change you know change some of the attitudes. But Paul, Bill, and Chris. Uh, just trying to remind myself of your admonition, no speeches. Um, so just coming from a teacher perspective uh, and work, most of my work is as a former classroom teacher and working with teachers, um, I've always been for using test scores, but as one measure and having a portfolio of, of multiple measures of things we look at. How many measures should we be looking at? I mean, we've just gone through this whole ESSA discussion. Marty, not to out you, but you are on the Board of Education here in Massachusetts. and. I don't know if we finalized uh, all the, uh, the numbers and, and metrics yet, but going forward, how do, how do we do that in an appropriate way, uh, and what, what emphasis do we put on different things? Uh, I, I, as somebody who actually taught in this city, in the Cambridge Public Schools, with fi only 15 schools, an A in one school was not an A in another school, and it still isn't, quite honestly, uh, and we've had choice for 40 years. So I hold on to actually having a standardized test score to make sure that there's some uh, accountability across uh, the schools. And can I just escalate that before you answer it? Like, um, so I know looking at the Connecticut sort of school improvement matrix, they went from like two factors to like 30. Yeah. And I was like, you guys are saying two was too many. <laughs> now you're gonna do 30, like how does that work? Just, so, just on that, I wanna say that I know the superintendents in the state and the teachers do not want 30 factors, you yeah. know, so. Uh, what's, what's the, the practical, Ooh, compromise. But Mark, Marty, you stepped on that one. Buy some time. Buy some time. I'm advising time just because I'm, uh, one of my New Year's resolutions was to read a book a month for pleasure. <laughs> I, I read, not that, that, not that we'll reading all of your papers wasn't pleasurable. Um, but, you know, a book that I read recently that I actually recommend for everyone that, that I, I made some connections with education is a, a book uh, called Extreme Ownership. Um, and it's written by two Navy SEAL commanders, Jocko Willink, which if any of you Google uh, and see if you met him in a dark alley, you would not be pleased. Um, but so he talks about actually leadership lessons from the Navy SEALs and how Navy SEALs team work. And I think it, it, there's actually lots of, uh, lots of really interesting things that can be taken away from that with education. This, their belief that you know, the enemy always gets a vote, right? You can have the best plan ever, but as soon as you go outside the wire, everybody else gets to do what they want to do as well, and you have to learn to adapt to that. But they actually devote an entire chapter around performance management, because they do a lot of business consulting and others. And one of the things that they push like over and over again is like, whatever you want, if you want to change people's behavior, it has got to be clear and it's got to be simple. Right, like that's how, it, and it doesn't matter what industry that you're working in, whether it's education or others. If you want something to change, it's got to be clear and simple. I mean, I look at so much of the business world has moved over to like the net promoter score, right? Like every time you stay at a hotel, or every time now it seems like you use any service at all, you get that email afterwards, would and you it's just got to a friend. You got two questions. Yep, rate it one to ten. Would you recommend this to a friend? You subtract the ones that are seven and above from the ones that are below, and that's your net promoter score. Um, so I think trying to search for those types of things, which capture like 80% of what you want. And sure, you could add 20 more factors that would get the last 20% of what you want, but if you can capture the bulk of that, the re response rates are high, it's clear, people understand how to do it. I think that's the type of thing that we should be, we should be looking for. Did that buy you enough time? Yeah, Larry? no, that, right. that's uh, <laughs> helpful and important, I think. Um, I, uh, so I don't have a specific answer to what's the right number of indicators. and. Uh, the answer to the right number is informed by like the viability or feasibility of using existing options that we have on the table you know available to us now um, so I think that um, we need to continue to report clearly on test score levels and growth uh, and that ideally we don't want to average them but characterize schools along two dimensions test score level, which tells you where improvement is needed, and test score growth, which tells you how much schools are contributing to addressing that problem. Uh, the current conversation has generally been about how much weight do we place on levels and how much weight do we place on growth. Really, they're telling us two different things and we shouldn't average them together. So, sort of, I, I do think that's the foundation because that's the one uh, objective uh, piece of data that we have. Um, and then the question is, what else do you uh, either 
build into an accountability rating or uh, provide information about on top of that. And that's where, because we've under No Child Left Behind mandated that every state and district in the country do the same thing for the past 12 years, we don't have much experience to draw on as to sort of the measurement properties of potential alternatives and more importantly, how educators respond to their use. So uh, I, I think we're in a time when we need to see people trying different approaches. I, I think Mike's advice that uh, you wanna keep things simple and manageable, your comments about Connecticut saying if you have accountability for everything, you have accountability for nothing, I guess, uh, uh, are both spot on. Um, so uh, I like the idea of building in chronic absenteeism, which is something that a number of states uh, are doing under ESSA. Uh, it seems to be something that schools can influence and differentiates them. Uh, at the high school level, there are a wide variety of options in terms of course access and enrollment uh, and success in advanced courses that um, uh, go beyond achievement. Obviously, for high schools, you can incorporate attainment directly as well, uh, but uh, if you're doing that, you need to be careful about the incentives that that yeah. creates as well. Um, I've done some work and a lot of people have done some work about the, a lot of places have thought about the possibility of incorporating student surveys about either their own social emotional development or their experience in the school's culture and climate. Um, I don't think we uh, know enough about the properties of those types of measures to recommend their use at this point, uh, nor how that would influence educators' behavior, but I, I hope we'll learn from places that are uh, piloting that type of data collection. So I'm gonna go to Bill for our final question. I just wanna uh, moderate a privilege. I think maybe the, the challenge is that uh, sort of like parent, parent selection could be like price. It's not one data point, it's actually like a million data points wrapped up in the one, so maybe part of the thing is that it is a vastly more sophisticated multivariate indicator than a well, single one. Within a district where you have a system where parents do have like, um, where their incentive is to be sincere about the preferences that they express in school choice, um, then that's exactly how I think you can interpret it. But you need to make sure that the choice system is designed in a way where parents don't have incentives to be strategic and not put their top choice because they think they won't get into that one. Uh, market theorists in economics have told us how to do that, but then you need to convince parents that they that they actually shouldn't be strategic, that they should be sincere as well. It's not clear that they uh, that they do that. But that, in a, in a nutshell, would be my preferred indicator if within a district that's using that type of system. Bill, last question. Yeah, in uh, in medical uh, circles with research, they call it bench to bet. How do we get from the lab to where we're actually implementing? So how do you take research and get it out there so you can really verify it? Uh, and it's the nexus around that in rolling you off the play, which is taking me to my question. It's got to be simple enough, as Mike said. So if you use test scores, high school graduation, college matriculation, those three things, you say, if you're going to have a choice program, you have to report all three of these things or a choice program can't exist. High schools, traditional public schools, are gonna have to do the same things. Those three things. How do you all as researchers convince policymakers that these have gotta go into the laws? Because that's what we're trying to help do that. So you then can do the long-term research, but if you're trying to measure 30 things, it's never gonna happen. Yeah, and I think ultimately, I, I, to a lot of what Marty said, I, the rubber meets the road of how that stuff is used. I think, uh, you know, the lift is lighter when it's, we want to use this stuff for informative purposes. We want to put that out there. The lift gets heavier, which was, and then we're going to use it to do X, Y, and Z, to have sanctions or close schools or others. And I think there are lots of schools with a fair bit of skepticism that says, okay, you'll say now that it's just for transparency. I mean, if you look at like the federal, go back to goals 2000 and like the Charlottesville summit and others, it was like, all this stuff's gonna be voluntary and we're just gonna report it. And then No Child Left Behind comes in and codifies it. So I think 
Um, I think in the short term, maybe the lift is say, we just want to use this for information and for research and for informing the marketplace and others. But that kind of rear guard action of saying, and we are going to make sure that this isn't used in these kind of pernicious ways that could lead to gaming behavior or others. That's, I think, the actual tough sell that has to take place. Last word, Pat. So I like the idea of combining high school graduation with college matriculation because the college matriculation is at least some check on the validity of the high school graduation because you know it's it's tougher to fool uh, college admissions committees than it is you know to to, to fool um, you know a community by handing out diplomas like candy at Christmas. least here. <laughs> right. So, so I, I like that idea. Um, in terms of, of the using test scores at the high school level too, I mean it's complicated by the fact that they generally only take end of course exams, not the kind of standardized tests. And and you don't. It's it's trickier to calculate gains because the tenth grade end of course tests are not really the same as the eighth grade. Uh, criterion uh, reference test. What you'd need is you'd need a school choice evaluation that's that's collecting its own uh, test data through administering its own test to to high school age students from ninth grade on, and then calculating the gain score from from that test. And that requires a, a lot of money. Um, it's not just handed to you by the district. Uh, how about uh, the date? Uh, yeah. You use the NAEP. Well, the, the problem with the NAEP is it's not an individual student level. It's not a consistent. I mean, they do have the longitudinal NAEP, uh, which 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 is a, a consistent sample. But the 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 regular NAEP is is a different set of students every time, and so you'd worry about compositional effects on that. It's tricky. I'd like to thank all three of our panelists. <laughs>